Well, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Hosea chapter 3. You can see it there on the slide, the title slide. And um, <clears throat> while the children are heading off to Children's Church, um, you should have a yellow uh, outline in your bulletin. And on the back of that, there's a couple of news items, a Labor Day combined service and a building update. So when you get a chance, uh, <clears throat> check that out. Hosea chapter 3, and um, I'm going to just start with verse 1. We've looked at this chapter a couple of weeks ago, and then we had a wonderful uh, break last week. We talked about baptisms, and we had six people uh, making that public declaration of their faith in Jesus Christ, and it's exciting. So we're kind of back to Hosea, and just a kind of reminder, we're uh, kind of looking at the, the minor prophets. I, I'm always hesitant to call them minor prophets. They have a lot to say. They're shorter than the big guys, but um, uh, they're also part of a scroll, typically a, a single scroll in the Hebrew canon uh, called the Twelve. And so Hosea is one of those. In fact, he's one of the earliest. He's a contemporary with Isaiah and Micah. Um, Mary was talking about the kings in the north and the kings in the south. Hosea ministered primarily to the northern kingdom, um, but he was also, uh, he connects himself with one of the kings in the south too to just to help us time his writings. And uh, just going to read verse 1 to start with. Uh, then the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by her husband, yet an adulteress. Even as the Lord loves the sons of Israel, though they turn to other gods and they love raisin cakes. Um, I have a confession. I love raisin cakes. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to check out what in the world is he talking about here. Um, you'll remember if you've been tracking with us, um, Hosea has this incredible um, expectation from his Savior. Uh, he is called as a prophet and he's... He is told, go marry this woman who is going to be unfaithful. And uh, we read about that in chapter 1 and chapter 2, some of the details. Chapter 3, uh, he's told to go and, and fetch her back, buy her back, in fact. Uh, a homer for Gomer, as a matter of fact. And uh, so he buys her back, and this chapter 1 describes um, Hosea loves her, and she's been unfaithful, and... Um, even as the Lord loves the sons of Israel. So this is a picture of spiritual adultery, uh, harlotry, if you will. This woman and this marriage to Hosea is a picture of God's broken heart. He, he married Israel and found her uh, unfaithful. In fact, it's been a long battle against God, inspired by the enemy, uh, Satan. He wants to uh, destroy Israel. He wants to destroy um, the Jews. He wants to destroy families. One of the challenges of the legacy and passing on the baton is that we have an enemy who does not want marriages to flourish. He does not want families to, uh, to hang together and to grow strong in the Lord and to know God's word. He doesn't want uh, our generation to pass on the baton faithfully to the next generation. He wants to break all that. And he's doing quite a good job, by the way. In fact, I just received some uh, information this very morning, as a matter of fact, from uh, a friend here that sent me an article, uh, USA Today, about how um, the Gen Z females are leaving the church in larger numbers than any other demographic. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit here, but the challenge to pass on our faith to the next generation, the next generation is very real. And if we're not intentional, and if we're not sacrificially buying into this, it's not going to happen. And it won't be very long before the church uh, folds up its doors and closes. So uh, here we are. Go back and get this unfaithful wife, Hosea, and take her to be with yourself. Uh, don't have relations with her. And that's a picture of right now what's going on between God and Israel. They're starting to come back into the country, and God is going to be faithful. He's going to keep his promises. But right now, there's a standoff. 
the Jews are in Israel uh, increasing numbers, but they are not there in faith. Um, they're going to come to faith. They're going to call on the hymn whom they uh, pierced, but not yet. And so there's a, there's a standoff right now. They're not, there's no intimacy with God, and it breaks God's heart. It doesn't take him by surprise, but he is working behind the scenes, and he's going to bring them back together. But here he's talking about an unfaithful uh, woman who typifies an unfaithful nation, and what do they do? They're going after other gods, and they love raisin cakes. And I'm just thinking, what's wrong with that? Uh, I get the going after false gods part, but actually raisin cakes, um, that's something that was used in worship, in pagan worship, uh, unbiblical worship, false gods, they used uh, raisin cakes. And um, this, I've titled my sermon, The Queen of Heaven. I just want to say, in case you have to leave before I'm done, there is no such thing as the queen of heaven. And yet that phrase appears twice in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is just a little bit after Hosea chronologically, but he's still before the Babylonian captivity. He is going to watch it. And he is going to be called the weeping prophet because he sees what's happening to his nation too. And he talks about um, the queen of heaven in chapter 7 of Jeremiah, verse 16 as for you, do not pray for this people, and do not lift up and cry a prayer for them, and do not intercede with me. In other words, it, it is getting to the point, and judgment has been pronounced, that God is telling his own prophet, don't pray for these people, the Jews. I'm going to lower the boom. They are going to go up, off into captivity. It's a done deal. They're going to spend 70 years away from the land. Don't even pray for them. I'm not going to listen to you. And then he tells us why. Verse 17, do you not see what they are doing in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? This, um, this going after strange gods, this spiritual adultery was visible to citizens. Certainly visible to God. He knows all, sees all. But this is going on. There's no shame. They're not even trying to hide it. Verse 18, the children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead the dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out libations to other gods in order to spite me. God had redeemed them. God had brought them out of uh, 400 years of slavery. God had uh, brought them into the promised land. He had made all kinds of covenants and promises. With, and how do they thank him? They, to spite him... They openly worship false gods. Um, and there's, there's a sexuality here, too, in this pagan rituals. It's not just a, uh, you know, they pray to the wrong guy. They are actually flaunting idolatry and immorality and uh, breaking God's heart. And he says it's a, it's a family affair. We're talking here about passing on the baton to the next generation. They were doing that with false gods. The children gather the wood, the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead the dough and make cakes for the queen of heaven, and they pour out libations to other gods in order to spite me. Verse 19, do they spite me, declares the Lord? Is it not they themselves they spite to their own shame? This is going to end up bad for them. Um, chapter 44, Jeremiah is the other uh, mention of the queen of heaven verse 18 chapter 44 but since we stopped burning sacrifices to the queen of heaven and pouring out libations to her we have lacked everything and have met not met our end by the sword and by famine and said the women when we were burning sacrifices to the queen of heaven and were pouring out libations to her was it without our husbands that we made for our her sacrificial cakes in her image and poured out libations to her. Verse 25, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, as follows, as for you and your wives, you have spoken with your mouths and fulfilled it with your hands. We will certainly perform our vows that we have vowed to burn sacrifices to the queen of heaven and pour out libations to her. Go ahead and confirm your vows. So um, the only references to the queen of heaven are in chapter 7 and chapter 44 of Jeremiah, but they're all a very strong hint 
that that's what's going on in Hosea chapter 3, verse 1. These raisin cakes are part of rituals of uh, false worship. And uh, notice how it's a family affair. Notice how the women are taking the leadership in this quite often. And it's, uh, it's out in the streets. It's throughout Judah. It's all over the place. They're worshiping false gods. And this has been going on since Genesis chapter 10. In fact, um, the enemy shows up in Genesis chapter 3 and the fall of Adam and Eve. He entices Eve. She uh, usurps Adam's role and she uh, sins and he falls for it too. Adam is not, um, he's not duped. He willingly sins. And so the sins of Adam come down to all of us down through the generations, Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Um, by the time you get to chapter 6, there's another rebellion. The angels leave their first estate, and they cohabitate with women, and they produce monsters, and God says, I'm wiping them out. There comes the flood. Then after that, there's another rebellion, Genesis chapter 10, the Tower of Babel. And from that point on, there's a system Babel, Babylonianism, that uh, goes all the way through the rest of the Bible, clear to Revelation chapter 17 and 18. There is an organized, pagan, idolatrous, immoral, religious system enticing young people to join and uh, thumbing their nose at the true God. And it is going on today... And in fact, in the Western church, it, uh, paganism is really gaining some steam. And as I mentioned a moment ago, um, one of the largest demographics leaving the Christian church, Gen Z females. And um, one of the reasons they do that, you know, people are, these articles are asking these young girls, why are you leaving the church? And one of the reasons is, they say, we feel like mules. And what that means is, they have been told by feminists and other people, uh, radical feminists, not, not biblical feminists, um, they've been told by people, oh, the women do all the work in the church, but they don't have any say in what's going on. They don't have roles in leadership, and uh, they're second-class citizens, and they're just looked at as mules. And so uh, they're going to abandon the church because they feel oppressed and suppressed, and they're going to go off into paganism. Paganism will use them for a lot of different ways and destroy them, but they don't see that yet. So they feel like mules. And I hope um, the ladies that go to church here, I've tried, and our, our board of elders, and I think we honor women here at this church. We believe they can have roles of leadership. We believe that there is no male or female, Jew or Gentile, bond or free in Christ. We are all equal. And... It's, it's unfortunate that um, publicity and propaganda, and, and true, uh, we might as well admit, some churches actually believe that women are second-class Christians. But we don't believe that here. We do believe, 1 Timothy chapter 3, that women cannot be, hold the office of elders. But they can do ministry. They can participate in leadership. We had Mrs. DeRoss up here addressing us, teaching us uh, just this morning. We have uh, women uh, committee chairs. We have women's ministries. We have a lot of uh, folks, uh, females, who are contributing to the life of this church. I am also happy to say that we have a bunch of guys here that are not just watching the women do all the work. We have men in this church who will step up and do work, too. So um, I'm sorry that some young ladies feel like mules. I hope they're not getting that from us, from our church. Um, here's another reason, um, and this kind of these tie together, but inequality. 
young women are saying, uh, you know, we can't be the head of the church, so we're going to go someplace where we can. Um, another thing, they feel like there's an unfair double standard. Uh, women are expected to be pure, and maybe young Christian men less so. And uh, in fact, um, some of the testimony in this article was that, um, you know, my brother can stay out late and my brother can go here and go there, but I have to stay home or I have to be uh, chaperoned or supervised and I can't go out and do fun. And so she was saying, uh, I feel like I am upholding the purity culture all by myself. Unfortunately, their answer to that perceived inequality is to go out and participate in immorality. Instead of raising the, the, the level of young men to purity, a lot of these girls are saying, well, no, I'll just become impure like them. And they think that's going to fix the problem. It's not. And we need to redouble our efforts, reach out to the young people, and uh, encourage them to understand they are valued by Jesus Christ. Dan's class this morning, <laughs> again, uh, it seems like the Holy Spirit's in charge here because a lot of times what he's covering in Sunday school, I'm going to address in the sermon. And uh, he's worked us through Ruth this morning. God elevated, protected, provided for this woman. Uh, she was an outsider. She was a Moabite. She was outside the covenant. And yet God loved her. God cared for her. God provided for her. And, and she's in the genealogy, Matthew chapter uh, 2, or Matthew chapter 1, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Valuable. Same thing with Tamar. She was uh, immoral. Rahab. Rahab was a Gentile prostitute. Uh, Bathsheba. She was an adulteress. And all those women are, are blessed by God and in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And we honor them, and we need to honor women in our midst as well. So Hosea's message, your fill-in here. First of all, what is keeping Israel from enjoying the blessings of God is their idolatry, the fundamental sin that poisons the covenant relationship with God. I talked a couple weeks ago about how uh, uh, Israel is the, the wife of Jehovah. Uh, he betrothed her. He purchased her. He provided for her. He protected her. He made a covenant with her, a, a marriage vow. And then she was unfaithful and went after strange gods. And God even says, I divorced her. But just like Hosea chapter 3, verse 1 this woman that went off and was unfaithful, Hosea, go get her. Redeem her. Bring her back. Don't have relations with, uh, with her for a while, but eventually she's going to be fully restored to be your wife. Same thing with Israel. Right now they are estranged from God. He hasn't forgotten them. He's going to save them. He's going to bless them. He's going to uh, be their God again. Just not yet. That time is coming. So um, another part of Hosea's message is ignorance. Verse 2 of chapter 3. So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a half. And then I said to her, you shall stay with me for many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. So I will also be towards you. So in this period that Hosea is writing about to the nation Israel, um, primarily the ten northern tribes, uh, Israel, uh, Assyria is rattling their sabers and they're getting ready to come down and they're going to cart the northern tribes off into captivity um, and they are ignorant. Their only hope is a reliance on the covenant that God made with them uh, through Abraham, through David, and through the land. And um, once, once they turn their back on that and they go after false gods... They put up the asterisk, they put up the, they, they, they follow astrological stuff, they follow uh, false gods of the, the, you know, not only did they want to have a king like other nations, they wanted to do other stuff like other nations too. Uh, idolatrous, immoral, sexual uh, worship on high places, no shame, 
no hiding it, no, no repentance. And God says, you are so ignorant. I want you to repent and I'll restore you. And they are in, right now they're in ignorance. Third thing, uh, immorality. God desires to heal a wicked people and he's going to. Verse 4 and 5. The sons will be remained for many days without king or prince, and that's their status right now, right? They are a country. They have independence. They don't have a king. They don't have a, a prince. They don't have a, a sacred pillar and without ephod or household idols. So um, uh, there's, they have false rituals they participate in, they don't have the true temple yet and the sacrificial system. They're going to have. Verse 5. Afterward, the sons of Israel will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. And they will come trembling to the Lord and to his goodness in the last days. Israel's future is still restoration. God is angry. God is judging them. God is brokenhearted. But God is faithful, and he will bring them back together, and he will bring them back to himself. So uh, this is a parallel not only with the nation Israel. This is a parallel with uh, worship in general, with, with church, with Christianity, with a, a relationship to the one true God. From Genesis chapter 10, God said to the people after the flood, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And they said, we don't want to. We're going to stay right here. We're going to build a tower that reaches to heaven, and we're going to build a name for ourselves. So another rebellion. And from that point on, it's sometimes visible, a lot of times kind of behind the scenes, like here in chapter 3 of Hosea. Uh, God can see it, but most of the population oblivious. So uh, it's going on today. It's starting to gain steam. Paganism, what is it? Well, here's an example. Iceland has constructed its first temple in over a 1,000 years. And who is it dedicated to? Not the true God, but to Thor and Odin. Um, paganism kind of fancies itself as inclusive. Thor and Odin are actually uh, gods who uh, are white. And some of these pagan temples say nobody, no non-whites need to apply. So they kind of want to be inclusive, but in some cases they're very exclusive. And Thor and Odin, white people. England hosts thousands each summer uh, during the summer solstice at, at Stonehenge. And what, what are they doing? Greeting the rising sun. What's that to have to do with it? Well, even way back Constantinople, in, in, uh, Constantine, excuse me, and even before that, sun worship. That happened in Genesis. That happened in the uh, Chronicles, Kings, Judges, Joshua, sun worship. And what are we doing these days? Sun worship. And it's gaining in popularity. It's cool now. Go to Stonehenge on summer solstice. Uh, here's another one. Edinburgh. Performers painted as red devils celebrate the Celtic fire festivals of Beltane and Samhain. False gods. Right out in the open. It's a tourist attraction. Hey, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands how many have been to the Burning Man thing down in Las Vegas. Same thing. Burning. Uh, UK sites host so the Burning Man festivals like the ancient Druids. Uh, Greece worship of the ancient deity Zeus, Apollo. Uh, it's kind of an easy target, but just think back if you watched it, the opening ceremonies of this past Olympics. It's, it's right out there, mocking the Last Supper, mocking Jesus Christ, promoting false gods and deities. It's all fine. Zeus, Apollo, Athena. Uh, the Getty Museum in L.A., children write prayers in, to Aphrodite. Hey, you can't write prayers to Jesus Christ in our schools, but they can have a program at one of the most famous museums on the West Coast, and you can write prayers to false gods. 
By the way, the goddess of love and lust, the patron goddess of prostitutes. Now, thank God, Jesus paid for the sin of prostitution. And prostitutes who place their faith in Jesus Christ, receiving that payment for their sins, can be saved. And in fact, they could be the genealogy of Jesus in the Old Testament cases. Prostitutes can be saved. Prostitutes can be missionaries and Bible teachers and, and godly women. They gotta repent. That's the same thing with any sin. I don't think any sins at all disqualify you from ministry if you repent, right? People get all upset that, well, can you, you know, can you ordain homosexuals? Of course you can, as long as they repent. If they want to keep practicing their sin, well, then you can't have that. That's the same thing with prostitution or anything else. If you're going to repent, you are qualified to serve Jesus Christ. If you're not going to repent, don't apply. This is in Yuba County. It used to be a grange. They bought it, and now they turned it into a pagan temple. What do they do there? Well, they have a food bank and a couple other things that they do, child care. So it's really community oriented, and uh, except on Sundays, they worship false gods. So paganism, um, sometimes it's associated with Wicca, uh, polytheism, uh, but it can also be atheistic, uh, Druidism, uh, hostile to Christianity, uh, relativistic. There is no absolute truth. So as people embrace, they say, oh, the church isn't treating me nice. I'm going to embrace paganism. And what are you doing? You're adopting a system that has no truth. You don't even know what you're joining. Why? Because it's fluid. They don't have any creeds. In fact, they're anti-creed. But somehow it's attractive. Why? Because there's sexual stuff. There's uh, enticements by our enemy, Satan. There are people who say, uh, oh, join us. You know, we, we have power. We can do stuff. Inclusive, except sometimes when it's not. Um, exclusive, anti-treatalism. So, um, that's where Hosea finds himself. That's where we find ourselves today. We're surrounded by uh, a growing appeal, attraction, uh, enticement to um, say no to the trappings of the church, to say no to the absolutism of the scriptures, to say, uh, you know, uh, we don't, we, this uh, Apostle Paul's position on leadership in the church is sexist. Um, husband and wife, sexist, keeps the women down, and all that stuff. And they go into a system that's going to separate them from God forever and ever and ever. <clears throat> I mentioned the Tower of Babel already. Um, blatant. God says, be fruitful and spread through the whole, all world, the whole world. And they say, no, we're not going to do that. We're staying. Tower of Babel still exists, uh, existed up to the time of Nebuchadnezzar, by the way, in Babylon. And Babylon's going to play a major role in the future. Revelation uh, chapter 17 and 18. Um, I mentioned these uh, passages in Jeremiah, the Ezekiel chapter 8, just before Daniel, a couple pages to the left here from Hosea. And so uh, here's God speaking to another prophet. Um, Verse 12, he said to me, Son of man, do you see what the elders of the house of Israel are doing, committing in the dark, each man in the room of his carved images? 
For they say, the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. And he said to me, yet you will see still greater abominations which they are committing. Then he brought me to the entrance of the gate of the Lord's house, which was to the north. And behold, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. And he said to me, do you see this, son of man? You, yet you will see still greater abominations. He brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the entrance to the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men with their backs to the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they were prostrating themselves eastward toward the sun. Where's this taking place? In the temple. Who's doing this? The priests. Oh, God has forsaken us. He, he's not watching. He can't see us. And the Lord says, Ezekiel, come look at this. Do you see this, son of man? Is it too light a thing for the house of Judah to commit the abominations which they have committed here? That they have filled the land with violence and provoked me repeatedly? It's interesting to me that women trying to escape oppression go into these false religions where they are used. In the Old Testament, a lot of these cities where they had the Ashtaroth and they worshipped uh, Baal and some other gods, they required women once a year. You come to the temple and you perform prostitute duties. If you don't do that, you have to pay uh, an exemption fee. And the women were flocking to this. They were participating. They were baking cakes. They were celebrating. Isn't this wonderful? Once a year, I go to the temple, and I, I'm a prostitute, and then I get to go home. And some of that, right inside the temple of God. Oh, he can't see me. Have you ever thought about you know, what you might be thinking or feeling inside this building at times like this? God knows. Is your heart really connected when you're doing communion and when you're singing these songs and you're listening to his word and you're serving in some capacity here? Is your heart engaged with the true God? Because if it's not, he knows. And it's not that he's going to hammer you it's that it breaks his heart. He died for you. He died for me. He, he rose for me. He's living inside me. He wants my heart, my mind, focused on him during these times. Harlotry in the past, you know, the Jews uh, adopted holidays, rituals, beliefs from the pagans around them. Moses said, God's going to take you into the promised land. Don't you follow those false gods. And then later in Deuteronomy, <laughs> he said, you're going to do it. You're going to go in there and you're going to follow these false gods and God is going to have to remove you from the land. That's exactly what happened. Why? Because we are all prone to worship something that we can see and touch and feel. An invisible God is hard to stay engaged with. And um, that happens in the church, not just Israel. The church, we've adopted holidays from paganism. One of the false gods, Ishtar. Oh, we, we sanitized it. It's called Easter now. But we have little bunnies and eggs that's paganism. Christmas. A lot of people will say Christmas is pagan. It's a pagan holiday. But, you know, I like celebrating the Lord's birthdays. So you might as well do it December 25th. But um, be careful. You don't get wrapped up in the trappings of the evergreen, right? A symbol of uh, fruitfulness, reproduction. Bunnies having eggs, reproduction comes right out of paganism. We even, um, you know, I, I know we can justify it theologically, but we changed our day of worship from Saturday 
to Sunday, consistent with the pagans' worship of the sun. Now, we celebrate the resurrection happened on the first day, so that's cool. But be careful, because we are so prone to syncretism. A lot of the churches, you know, non-evangelical churches, they've, uh, wherever they go through the world, they kind of modify their practices to adopt to local expectations, syncretism, and they absorb stuff. And I'm thinking, just like here in Ezekiel, uh, God is looking and watching, and our duplicity breaks his heart. Will Durant, a historian, says Christianity did not destroy paganism, it just adopted it. You know, uh, people <clears throat> have asked, why don't we have a steeple on this building? Well, where does it say in the Bible we well, have to have one of those? Because a lot of pagan temples have steeples. So be careful. Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for... I put an E on there. Thinking of golf. <laughs> you talk about duplicity. I'm sorry. I need to stay focused. Um, let's end with this. This, this, uh, the Babylonian worldview, paganism, is not dead. It's kind of, you know, there's sometimes where it was very, in, you know, invisible for a while. It's starting to rear its ugly head again. And check out Revelation chapter 17. We just finished studying this this summer. But um, this is Babylon. First seven verses. One of the seven angels had the seven bowls, came and spoke with me, saying, Come, I shall show you the judgment of the great harlot. So this spiritual harlotry is still an, a thing. And in verse 2, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality. Again, false religion and sex and money always go together. Verse 3, he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. Again, I'm, uh, I'm not going to put too fine a point on this, but frequently false religion is tied or pictured as a woman. And uh, Zechariah chapter 5, it talks about the woman being carried away in a basket with a lid, uh, lid on it. This is the harlot. And uh, now that's not to minimize what I said earlier. We believe women are equal to men in the body of Christ. But here we have... The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and of the unclean things of her immorality. Not only does uh, she participate in a religion of perversion, but she also participates in a religion of blood, not blood sacrifice, murdering the saints. Verse 5, upon her head... A name was written, the mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered greatly. And the angel said to me, why do you wonder? I shall tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. That is still future. This abomination, the, this paganism, these false gods, Still going on today. Be on guard. And then the last one, chapter 18. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illumined with his glory. And he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. And she has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality. That's um, good old U.S. of A. is included in that. All of the nations are going to be going after Babylon. The mask will be off. The gloves are off. Full force pursuing 
Babylon and false religion and hating Jesus and his saints. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you may not participate in her sins, and that you may not receive of her plagues. For her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back, even as she has paid, and give her back to her double according to her deeds. In the cup which she has mixed, mix twice as much for her. To the degree that she glorified herself and lived sensuously, to that same degree give her torment and mourning. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen, and I'm not a widow, and will never see mourning. For this reason, in one day her plagues will come, pestilence and mourning and famine, and she will burn, be burned up with fire, for the Lord God who judges her is strong. It's heartbreaking to see young people rejecting the grace of God in the church of Jesus Christ and trading it for paganism, which will oppress and suppress and destroy and Put them on the enemy's list from God Almighty instead of being called a child of God they're going to be part of Babylon and her sensual immorality false religion and in one hour Babylon will be destroyed that's what Hosea is trying to warn the northern tribes hey you better turn to the true God or you will go up in smoke. And the ten tribes did. They went up in smoke. You don't have to do that. I encourage you, stay focused on Jesus Christ. Understand the truth that women are equal and highly valued by God and by us. And we need you. Don't bail out. Don't give up. And the rest of us, the guys, we need to encourage them and to value them and to uh, place them in places where they can minister and we can minister to them. And this will strengthen the church. And it will make us fruitful as we try to reach the next generation for Jesus Christ. Well, uh, God bless you, and let's close with a song. <clears throat>